My topic this morning is calculation and socialism. And I want to start by <clears throat> bringing to your attention a very important article, probably the most important economics article written in the 20th century. Uh, and that's the article by Ludwig von Mises, which appeared in 1920 in German. It uh, wasn't translated until uh, 1934 uh, into English. And uh, it's called Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. We have a copy of it as a pamphlet. Okay? Um, and I, I highly recommend the epilogue by a modern Austrian economist. Uh, sheds a lot of light on the, on the article. But this article is important for, for, for two reasons. One, it completely destroyed the intellectual foundations of the case for central planning. Okay, nothing was left standing after this article. In fact, in this article, Mises answered a lot of criticisms that he got later on. He answered them in advance. But secondly, it also pointed out the nature and necessity of the price system. It finally gave an adequate explanation based on, on Menger's uh, original analysis of price of why, just why, we need the price system and what, and what the role of the price system actually is in a market economy. Now, Mark, now Mises developed that further in, in later works, but he, he really did set it out for the first time. Uh, this whole idea that prices, real prices, are necessary for calculation, for figuring out costs, revenues, prices, uh, profits, um, losses, and so on. So that, that's extremely important. So even if there, even if there really was no ca uh, socialism, the article itself, as, as a piece of economic theory, is, is very important. And it's also very accessible. It's written in a very easy style, uh, and it, it makes its points very directly. Mises is a very good writer. So let's start off with socialism as it developed in the early 19th century. It was developed by, um, most notably, two Frenchmen, and, you know, the French, and... <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Louis. And a guy from Wales uh, who, uh, who uh, uh, migrated to the United States. So we have Charles Fourier, Henri Saint-Simon, and Robert Owen. And they wrote in the first half, uh, or even first quarter, of, of, of the 19th century. And basically, they were all crazy. Okay. Now, <laughs> Karl Marx even realized that they were crazy, as we'll see. And more, uh, more, the, the way that Marx uh, carried out his project of introducing socialism and, and promoting socialism was to, to basically uh, ignore or push a, or um, to declare unscientific the utopian socialists. And Marx really had a point here. Ah. Now, that's quite a disturbing image. That's Charles Fourier, the craziest of them. Uh, and his idea of socialism was to organize everybody into fallen stairs, which it's based on the, um, an ancient Greek military formation, okay, rectangular military formation. And so he developed models of, of cities uh, uh, that, that were, were more or less uh, looked like grand hotels, or they were or organized like grand hotels. Um, and, and he had very specific ideas about how humanity was, was going to interact in these uh, various uh, fallen stairs. Each resident would be able to purchase commodities according to his or her you know, to taste and income. So there was still to be money. Um, all residents would be a stockholder in the city. There would be collective production. People would produce things together. There wouldn't be competition. Uh, all me meals would be shared in a, in a communal kitchen. Okay, he had very specific ideas about this. And the dirty work would be shared. So, you know, people would take turns taking out the garbage, cleaning out the pigsty, and the horse stables, and whatever else he had in mind. That's a drawing of it. Now, these guys all, they all liked symmetry. They thought symmetry should be everywhere. You know, every so th this thing is very, very symmetrical, this sketch. Here's a model of it. Here's the grim reality. That's near my house, actually. That's an abandoned fallen stair. In a, a few were set up in the United States. Okay, it's pretty scary. 
So needless to say, these, all these plans failed. And at the same time, the classical economists uh, showed that th there were real problems, even though they hadn't developed Mises' critique of, of socialism at this point. So here, here are some of the things that, that Fourier said. Um, that uh, This is a, a quote from a, a book on the history of economic thought by uh, Bob A. Bear and uh, um, Robert Eakland. And uh, just look at that. So he's telling us, uh, he has some secret source of knowledge. So he says that 19th century France went through five stages, uh, confusion, savagery, patriotism, um, and barbarity. And now they were passing through the fifth stage where they were advancing. Okay? But there'll be two more stages. Now, how did he know this? God told him? How did he know this? Okay? <laughs> they, all of these utopian socialists were Gnostics in some broad sense. Gnostic is someone who believes that he or she has a secret source of intuitive knowledge that no one else has, that somehow they're connected to the, the cosmos or something. So notice what he says here. The final stage would be a stage of utter bliss, and that would last for 8,000 years. Not 7,000, not 9,000, 8,000 years. <laughs> okay, so he, he knew that for certain. And then history would reverse itself, and you'd run back through all the stages and go back to savagery. Okay. Okay, so that's an idea of his thinking. Here's some other crazy things. Um, so the, the, the stage of bliss, he called the stage of harmony. The six new moons would replace the one in existence. <laughs> it gets better. There'd be a halo, which sort of sh sh uh, shower uh, dew down upon the, the, the earth, and it would circle the North Pole. Uh, the seas would turn to Kool-Aid or some kind of fruit juice. I wouldn't drink it. <laughs> all violent, this is interesting, all violent and repulsive beasts would be replaced by their opposites. There'd be anti-lions, anti-whales, anti-bugs, and so on, okay? And you could ride lions, and roasted chickens, roasted chickens would fly into you, your mouth. <laughs> well, you can find this, and there are still people uh, who, who, who uh, even in his, I found a book in his, uh, of his writings that was, that was published in the late 70s or 80s and was used in a classroom, okay? There, it was used as a classroom uh, reading. At Berkeley? Yeah, probably. <laughs> okay, and of course, the uh, human, life, human lifespan would stretch to 144 years, and five-sixths of the time would be devoted to the unrestrained pursuit of sexual love. Now, all of these guys are... If you read them, most of them talked about, were infatuated with free love, okay? Uh, and they were all males, so the, um, <laughs> the opposite, by the way, of, 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 unfortunately, females get stuck with the term nymphomaniac or nymphomania. Well, there is a comparable male condition known as satyriasis and satyrs. They all seem to be, me to be that, a satyr, right? They're all talking about free love and how everything would be great and, you, and, and, and you know, partners would be shared and so on, okay? So that was an example of Fourier. Very embarrassing to, to, to Marx. Um, the classical economists really responded and destroyed them by pointing out, uh, you know, who's going to take out the garbage under socialism? You need prices to give people an incentive, prices and profits, to do the dirty, grubby jobs. Who's going to take out the, get up early in the morning, take out the garbage? Who's going to go deep into, into coal mines where it's dangerous and do this unhealthy and difficult work? Well, under, social, un, under uh, capitalism, there's what we call wage differentials. People who do these things, all other things equal, get paid more than people who do a similar job that isn't dirty or uh, um, a hazard to your health. Okay. The socialist said, no, 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 there'll be a new socialist man uh, and woman who will uh, work not for profit, not for grubby money profit or for money income, but for the welfare of the community. Unasked and unargued in all this was that socialism could be as productive as capitalism if you could solve this so-called incentive problem. That is that collective production would only fail because people don't have the incentive to produce. Okay? They don't have the incentive to do certain jobs. However, they, neither, the, neither the classical economists nor the utopian socialists brought up the um, idea that how would you know exactly what to produce under socialism? Okay. They both 
more or less believe that, well, under socialism, if you could solve the incentive problem, that's where it really stood, then you, you, you would have uh, socialism being as productive as capitalism. Okay. And this is where Mises' uh, thesis about why socialism is impossible comes in, onto the scene. Okay. So really, uh, as J.B. Say, the, the great French economist, pointed out, well, I call the Frenchman great, but as, as he pointed out in, in 1802, um, human beings can't create anything because it used to be said that they create goods, that people create goods and services to satisfy their wants. They can't create anything. They can only transform elements of their environment, natural resources and labor, into things or consumer goods that are more useful in satisfying human wants. Okay. So Marx wanted to shut these people up. He didn't want anybody to read them. So he used a brilliant polemical ploy, and I transpose the words inadvertently there. Uh, one, of the, one of the greatest um, uh, rhetorical ploys in, in history. And basically what he said was that there's, there's something called scientific socialism. Under scientific socialism, you don't talk about socialism. It's like the rule of Fight Club. The first, <laughs> first rule of socialism is you don't talk about socialism. You only criticize capitalism. So you get rid of all this nonsense that the utopian socialists were spouting, right? Uh, he said, well, look, the reason why you don't talk about socialism is because the inexorable laws of history, as he called them, just as, as we have inexorable laws of, of, of nature, just as an apple falls from a tree toward the ground, all, of, all other things equal, the same thing will ha happens in history. Just as Greek and, and, and Roman slave societies were replaced by uh, feudalism, which in turn were replaced by commercial capitalism of, of, the middle, of, the, of the late Middle Ages, which was then replaced by industrial capitalism. Well, in the same way, capitalism will give way to socialism. So there's no reason to argue about it. Okay? Anyone who argues about it, doesn't understand the laws of history, is stupid and unscientific. So you should just all shut up about it. And that, that worked. The utopian socialists just sort of faded away. So you don't, you don't speculate about the future. And in fact, look at what Marx, Marx's writings were all a critique of capitalism. His great work was called Das Kapital, okay, capital. Didn't, didn't, he never talked about socialism, right? almost never. He, he, he made vague allusions to a uh, a, a law of history that would cause socialism to be pl placed by communism, and he talked about everyone um, being able to uh, um, do all different kinds of jobs, and he did, did say that, that, the, that the average human intelligence would rise above that of an Aristotle uh, or um, a da Vinci and so on. He said things like that, but they were sort of off-the-cuff remarks. And if you note, you'll note that sort of harking back to the... Um, to the utopian socialists. But he gave no systematic statement of what socialism would be, how it would operate, okay? what, what sort of, of, of economic system it would be. Okay, okay so what is, was Mises' argument against this? This is when Mises responded. Mises said that the rational allocation of resources is impossible without economic calculation using market, real market prices. Okay. So this was called the, called the impossibility thesis. Mises was saying that a socialist economy, strictly speaking, was impossible. Right. And we'll, we'll come back to that and to the criticisms of him for making that strong statement. Um, and his argument was very simple. He said, look, socialism abolishes private property in the means of production. You, could, you can own consumer goods, uh, non-durable consumer goods, the clothes on your back, the food, and so on, but you can't even own homes and so on, let alone factories and mines and farms and so on. So uh, the, the, the essence of socialism was the collective ownership of the means of production. Okay. So he pointed out, since the, the, uh, the, the socialist state is the sole owner of all the means of production, Okay, the material factors of production, uh, we're assuming that labor is not, it's not slave labor, though it turns into that, but, but Mises gave them the benefit of the doubt on that. Um, since they own all these things, they can't be exchanged. If one group of people owns everything, then there's, there's no market. 
Without exchange, then there can be no market prices. Uh, without market prices, how can the state calculate the cost of production? How can it know in producing one thing whether it's using resources that are more valuable used elsewhere? It can't know that, okay, because it, it can't, doesn't have any prices for the factors of production because they are not exchanged because there's a sole owner of all of the factors of production. So Mises concluded, in the absence of economic calculation of profit and loss, socialist planners cannot know the most valuable uses of scarce resources, and therefore a socialist economy is strictly impossible. Economy in the sense of Menger's economizing, using resources for their most highly valued ends. That's not to say that central planners cannot set themselves up and produce something, okay? But the production will be chaotic and will not even serve the purposes of the planners. That was Mises' argument. So he focused not on, on the fact that the planners might not have enough knowledge, because they could always um, hire or impress into service scientists, engineers, um, and, and various other technical people. Okay? What Mises pointed out was that so the problem of socialism was the problem of one will acting. That is, one person determining how resources were going to be allocated. And if one person owned all those resources, there could not be prices. So the essential mark of socialism is that one will alone acts. It's immaterial whose will it, it is. It could be somebody who's very benevolent, very smart, it doesn't matter. The main thing is that the employment of all factors of production is directed by one agency only. Um, and then he says, you know, one alone chooses, directs, and so on. Um, and that is the problem that there's no, what he later called, intellectual division of labor. Everyone in society participates in creating, and, and this is created, the, the, the price system, okay? Ideas, concepts, certain social um, expressions of, of, of interactions among people can be created. There are new things under the sun. The price system is something that does not exist before people interact, and it cannot be um, created by one person. It has, it's a social uh, creation. I'll come back to that. So what are the preconditions of economic calculation? Well, first of all, Mises says there has to be private property in all stages of production, including land, mines, factories, and so on. It has to be, they have to be privately owned so that they can be exchanged. Um, and they also have to be permitted to be exchanged. Okay. So that's to be private property, there has to be free exchange, and there has to be sound money, money whose value doesn't fluctuate wildly, as, for example, during a hyperinflation. Basically, money that, uh, who, who, whose value is not influenced or determined by the political authorities. So those are the three preconditions. And guess what? Socialism abolishes all of those conditions, okay? There is no private property in the means of production, there, there is no freedom to exchange. And finally, uh, money is not used. There, there might, workers are paid rubles, but the rubles that they're paid are really vouchers to buy consumer goods. Okay? There are no commodities markets, stock markets, um, people trading businesses and so on. Money is not used for that purpose. So it's not really money. It's just vouchers to go to the, the company store, in this case a socialist company store. And, 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 and buy the things that they may produce. So, so since socialism abolishes all of these three, three preconditions, it nullifies economic calculation, and therefore it destroys the social division of labor. The interaction of people and specialization of people that, brings a, that, that is directed by monetary calculation. Okay, so let's show what the problem of socialism is and what it is not. Let's say you have a problem of, of wanting to produce a car, okay? Uh, well, the socialist planner certainly will know the production function. That is, the various uh, resources that are um, combined and transformed into the final good, and in what proportions they should be combined. You can easily get that from engineers and scientists and so on. So if a car takes P tons of steel, Q hours of machine time, R hours of unskilled labor, 
um, hours of engineering labor, square feet of factory space, kilowatts of energy, gallons of paint, and so on. You cannot add those up under socialism to get a cost. Okay, it's like adding apples and oranges. Okay? You, you use up certain different resources, but there is no unitary cost. You cannot determine how much it costs to produce this wonderful car, Chevy SS, which I'm very favorable to. I own its forerunner, which is the old Pontiac G8. But let's say that's the car that the, 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 the uh, um, socialist planner wants to produce. Should he produce that automobile? Or would those, all those resources be better used to produce 20 motorcycles, which he also knows how to produce? He doesn't know the answer to that. He doesn't know which good is more valuable, which is a more valuable use of those resources. So how can we calculate the cost of producing the car under socialism, okay? In the market economy, everything that's needed to produce any good has a price at every moment. So no matter what you want to produce, you can look at the price structure, the prices of goods that you're interested in, okay? And they're not, they're not exactly present prices, they're the prices that have just been paid. You can look at those prices and you can extrapolate what they would cost you um, to produce this particular good by combining those resources. So you'll always know your cost of production. Now, we're not saying that entrepreneurs, because they can calculate, do not make mistakes, okay? Certainly mistakes can be made, okay? So a firm can forecast that the price of this automobile will be $44,000 once it's produced, once it's and on the showroom floor at the dealer three years down the road. So, so the entrepreneur is always forward looking. The future is uncertain. So he may very well be wrong. It may turn out that that car was a waste of resources, that he used resources that could have produced things worth $40,000, because other he has to pay $40,000 for the inputs into the car, because other entrepreneurs are bidding for those resources also and wanting to use them for other goods and services, building houses, constructing factories, whatever it may be. So he knows his costs. But that doesn't mean he cannot make um, forecasting errors. So entrepreneurs can make forecasting errors. But the point is, they know that they've made a mistake or, or that they've been very successful. If the car turns out to be $38,000, then they've made a mistake. Then they stop producing if they th think conditions are not going to change. And they shift resources to, to other products. Okay? Or the firm goes bankrupt and resources are, are, um, are, 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 are liquidated and used elsewhere. But the problem with socialism is that socialism cannot figure out the cost of, 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 of any product that it produces because there are no prices. So they never know whether they're producing things that have more value than other things that could have been produced or whether they're just wasting resources. Another um, problem with socialism, which is you know, related to all of this, what technology do you use? Remember, cars, up until 1914 or 15, cars used to be put together by hand. So they, they were usually produced in small bicycle shops or um, uh, places where you, you produced uh, uh, buggies, blacksmith shops where, where uh, blacksmiths uh, put shoes on horses and produced buggies and so on. They used to be produced in those small shops by five or six technicians that together produced all the parts and then assembled the car. So that was very labor intensive. A lot of labor was used, very little machinery was used. Okay? In today's world, we have uh, uh, plants, automobile assembly plants, that are completely you know, robotized, where there's a few guys you had to push buttons on the computer, and the, the, the robotic equipment assembles the, the automobiles. Okay, so do we use should we use a lot of labor and a little of capital, or, or should we use a lot of capital and a little labor? That depends on prices. That depends on prices showing what things are, are scarce and what things are not as scarce. So in this example, should we use the titanium bumper, which is absolutely um, impervious to any sort of dents and, and so on, or should we use a steel bumper or a fiberglass bumper? Okay. Well, it depends on the cost of these things and the cost of repairs. But the socialist planner can never know those costs. So that's the problem with socialism. Now, what Mises did not say was that 
all economies need calculation. He, he didn't make that claim. So he talked about a Crusoe economy. He said, look, if you don't have a uh, highly complex industrial economy with, a, with many, many um, complicated processes of production and heterogeneous um, forms of capital goods, if you simply have a simple economy where there's you know, labor and some natural resources, then you can run the economy rationally. That is, you can produce the things that have the highest value. So take this example of Robinson Crusoe. Okay? So let's say he allocates his labor in three-hour lumps, and so he works 12 hours a day. Well, then he'll produce those things that are most valued to him. That will exhaust his, the 12 hours. Because you have something that you can easily add up, hours of labor, that's basically the only factor of production there. Um, but what's the cost of producing a rabbit that requires six month, uh, hours to hunt and catch? Okay. Um, can he allocate his labor rationally in that case? Can he figure out the opportunity cost? Yeah, in this simple example, certainly you can. You know that the least valuable use of your labor is to produce eight coconuts and one sack of berries. That's the least valuable use of the six hours that would cost you to get the rabbit. So you would produce, if, if the rabbit was valued higher than the eight coconuts and one sack of berries, you would produce the rabbit, okay? You would change your production plan. But that, in, a, in an economy like the United States, okay, it, of the present day, that's just not possible. There are thousands, there are, there are hundreds of thousands and possibly millions of different types of goods in the economy. Okay? And you cannot figure out the values of these things without money prices. So what capitalism does, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, let me just go back here. Um, that picture is out of, um, I want, what I want to do is, well, let me, let me talk about socialism for a moment, because I, I, did, I did sort of get to the uh, socialist, uh, the problem with socialism. And then I'll come back and I'll talk about the market economy a little bit more. But um, OK, so let's look at sort of the applied problem of socialism. So social, social central planning is called gross output planning, or at least it was in the USSR and Eastern European economies. And what gross output planning was, was the assignment by the central planning agency in, in, in the Soviet Union, it was called GOSPLAN, G-O-S-P-L-A-N. Um, and what GOSPLAN did was to assign to the various commissars of the different industries uh, targets. So, let's say this is the nail industry. Well, we want you to produce X million tons of nails. Or if it was a clothing industry, we want you to produce, let's say, A yards of, uh, A, let's say, million yards of, of women's clothing and, and B million yards of men's clothing and children's clothing. So they would give a, 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 a sort of a, an output target that, that the, the um, uh, producers were, were supposed to meet. So then the commissars would, would then go to the factory managers, the, 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 the factories that existed in that industry, and would tell them what their targets were. Now, of course, this is a system of mutual lying, right? Because what was the incentive to produce? The incentive to produce and, and meet your target and exceed your target was that you got bonuses, okay? You got more vacation time on a, a, a dasha on the Bl a Black Sea, okay? You got more vacation time, or you might, you might get more r ration tickets or rubles to buy food and so on. But on the other hand, if you didn't meet your target, you got a, a, a ticket to Siberia. Okay. So what was the optimal strategy? The, the manager would say, well, you know, that's a very high, we can't meet that target. That's too high. Because he wants the target as low as possible so he can meet it and maybe exceed it a little bit. Of course, then, the commissar and, and, and the central planners, they know that everybody's going to lie about this. So they always make the target higher than, than the uh, manager will tell them. Uh, they can accommodate. But of course, the manager knows that they know that they're going to be lying, so they lie and make the target even lower. So it's, it's, so it's a sort of mutual lying. Okay. All right, now, it's very difficult. You, you can tell, you can give people a gross amount of, of the good to produce. That's, that's fairly simple, fairly straightforward, right? But it's hard to tell them the exact variety, specify the exact varieties and specify the exact kinds of things and qualities of things that you want. So there were numerous problems that continually cropped up in the Soviet Union. Just to give you some examples, there was a shortage of uh, many, many Soviet structures were built, but they were missing, they were missing roofs, okay? They didn't have a roof. And the reason why they didn't have a roof, even though everything else was complete, was because there was a shortage of building nails. 
in the Soviet Union. Uh, roofing nails. Roofing nails are very small nails. Um, it takes more resources per um, uh, weight of a small nail to produce a small nail than it does to produce a big nail. So the Soviet, typical Soviet a nail plant would produce a lot of big nails, and that's where I wanted to, get, to show you. So this is a, a Soviet cartoon, right? And so that's the plant manager telling, telling the commissar, well, I met my, my output target this year. Produce one giant nail. But that sh you know, that's obviously a cartoon, but it, sh it makes the point that th they don't care about quality. All they care about is meeting the quantitative target that's given to them. Uh, other examples, w women wa walked around in basically tents. If you were a petite woman in, in, um, in USSR, it was very difficult to get clothing that fit. It was very difficult to get children's clothing that fit. Why? Because it was easier to make a few big clothes, uh, you know, fewer big size um, uh, dresses and so on than some small size dresses. And also, of course, there was, there was no fashion and so on so, uh, for the same reason. Okay, why, put, uh, why take more time and resources to make the clothing more fashionable, uh, which would risk missing your target? Um, Khrushchev, the Soviet dictator, uh, once made a cryptic remark, uh, at least to Western observers, when he, in the middle of a speech, he began berating the uh, chandelier industry. And uh, the chandelier industry, of course, they were given gross output targets. So they made their chandeliers very big and very heavy. And they were pulling down the ceilings and crushing the, the, com uh, the, crushing the comrades, uh, the, you know, the rich so Soviet apparatchiks that had them in their homes and in their vacation homes. Okay. So that was a problem. Just making chandeliers was a problem. Okay. And, and of course, you had the, uh, the Soviet famine in, in the mid-'80s. You had a lot of tractors. They were sitting in the fields. They were rusting. There was a lot of unharvested grain. Okay. But you used too many resources to plant the grain, to, to make the tractors. There was a shortage of gasoline. There was a shortage of laborers to, to drive the tractors, because they were all in the factories making the steel and making, the fac and making even more tractors. So it was a crazy machine that just ran to no purpose. Of course, our CIA um, took these, so they would add these, all these things into their GDP, even though they were useless, rotting, rusting. They would add them into the GDP. So the CIA and, and, and many American economists uh, back in the, the 80s and 90s were saying that by 2012, the gap between uh, the Soviet economy and the U.S. economy will close, and the Soviet, Soviet economy will be bigger than the U.S. economy after 2012. That was all shown to be complete nonsense, because what was being produced were, were, were malinvestments, were anti-products, were products that had no use. Okay. Uh, and there, there was a joke that used to go around uh, among Soviet economists when they met their Western counterparts at, at meetings. Uh, th they would say, uh, they would use Khrushchev's old line, uh, we will bury you. Okay, so, so Khrushchev once famously or infamously banged his shoe, took his shoe off, I don't want to be there for that, and banged it. On, on the table at the UN and said, we will bury you, meaning we will bury you economically to the West. So the Soviet economists would say, oh, yes, we will bury you, but we'll leave Hong Kong so that we can see the prices. <laughs> so, so we have an idea, at least, of, 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 of things to produce. Okay. So one of the um, objections to Mises' uh, um, impossibility thesis was, well, what are you talking about? The Soviet Union lasts for over 75 years. Okay. But Mises had already met this objection in his original article, in which he pointed out that the Soviet Union today is not a true socialist economy. And it's not a true socialist economy because it exists in a sea of capitalist prices. Just like the U.S. Post Office is not a, is not a socialist entity, because the U.S. Post Office exists in a sea of, of, of prices. As inefficient as the U.S. Post Office had been before FedEx and so on. I mean, it's still inefficient, but, but back before FedEx and um, UPS and so on, it was extremely inefficient. Okay. But it still, it still operated. It, it still more or less responded to consumer demand, okay, though very, very inefficiently. So that was Mises' point, that, look, the Soviet Union was really a monopoly. It was a monopoly capitalist entity in some sense. It sold coal. It sold electricity. You know, there was foreign trade. Uh, it sold diamonds and, 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 and other things. It used capitalist prices. Now, those prices, since they were, were formed in a different location and with different people with different values, those prices did not 
truly reflect the scarcities of resources in the Soviet Union, which is the reason why the Soviet Union eventually did break down. Okay, they were using uh, prices from capitalist economies. And there was a story that uh, during the 1950s and, 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 and 60s that the Chinese uh, central planners, um, Sears noticed that they were sending a lot of catalogs to China. Okay, and, and, and one of the reasons for that was that the Chinese were using the prices from the Sears catalog to get some idea of, of how to price things. The only true period of socialism that existed in the world was from 19, uh, for, an, for a semi-industrial country was from 1917 to, to 1921. It was a period of war communism when the whites were fighting the reds uh, in uh, Soviet Russia. And it was during that period that Lenin outlawed all prices, told um, his uh, planners not to use prices, not to refer to the West's prices, just to, to, to plan without prices. What happened? Well, what happened was that production became totally chaotic. People began burning. There wasn't even enough firewood or coal or, or, or anything to, to um, fuel to keep people warm during the winters. They began burning their furniture. Then they began burning parts of their houses. Then there was food shortages. Uh, and, and they moved out to the countryside. And you had just a, a nomadic, predatory groups of people trying to find food. Just That's what so... Now, socialism can support an economy like that, an economy of small groups that have very few processes of production that aren't, aren't very complicated or very short. So socialism results in the complete destruction of the social division of labor, of people cooperating to produce goods and services. Okay? So socialism destroys society as we know it. If, if, you, if, you, if you realize, as Austrian economists do, that society is based on the division of labor among human beings, then in fact, you'll, you'll, you'll um, understand why that, that happened. Okay. Oh, let me mention an another uh, s small anecdote, uh, just to show you, a, uh, show, show, sh or sh illustrate the problem with calculation. I had, I have, have, I had a friend, I have a friend, um, but a number of years ago, she moved from New Jersey to Montana um, and married a real cowboy, somebody who actually lived on a ranch and actually had cattle and rode horses. And so a few years, they lived in a big house, but they had a growing family. So um, she called me up one day and said, well, you know, we, we, we just got, a, we just moved, we just got a, big, a, a new house. That's how she put it. We just got a new house. And I said, oh, really? I said, did you move off the ranch or did you have another one built? She said, well, no. She says, we, um, we, we ordered one. And we just uh, took our other one apart and, and replaced it with a new one. So what, what happens out there where there's about you know, 12 people in Montana, <laughs> labor is very scarce. It has a very high price, unlike the Northeast or the Southeast, where, where people, when they build a house, come to the land where it's being built and actually construct the infrastructure and then the house itself. Um, out in Montana, people order houses from factories. The factories are in Nebraska. There's factories in Nebraska. They put together the house in, in pieces, so it's done with a lot more capital, a lot less labor. They put, put together the houses in modular pieces, and then they ship the houses on, on these trucks, on these wide load trucks. And so, now, would a central planner ever figure out that it's more economical to build the house two thousand or a thousand miles away? Of course not. But this was the cheaper way of building the house. When, when, you, when you know your cost of production, you can come up with these innovative ways of, of um, producing products. Okay. Okay, so now I want to just talk a little bit about the, the, the sort of the essence of the market economy, which, uh, which Mises is called the intellectual division of labor, not to be confused with what Hayek called uh, the division of knowledge. The intellectual division of labor tells us that everyone, everyone, no matter what your status is, what your job is, what sort of a, a, a income you have, everyone participates in creating the price system, the price system which allows calculation. Mises called this a social appraisement process. It's what allows prices of resources to emerge, emerge from nowhere. These things are created. Okay? They're created out of the interaction of human beings. No one human being can create a, a, a price system. The 
Pricism isn't the outcome of a single human will or a single human mind, okay? It transforms, it, it transcends human beings, though all of us contribute to it. And here it is. You have the entrepreneur always at the center of the market economy. The entrepreneur is seeking profit, and in order to do so, he has to have an idea of what consumers will pay for his product. Not today, and in fact, it may be a completely new product, by the way, but what they will pay for the product a year from now, six months from now, maybe even five years down the road. From planning stage to uh, a dealer floor, uh, a showroom, uh, it takes five years for a new model car to get, get produced. So you're looking at supply and demand down the road. So since we have prices, and there are prices of automobiles today, the entrepreneur uses that experience of present prices, or if it's a new good like a tablet computer that hasn't been produced before, the, the iPad, um, you look at other goods that might, might be substitutable for it, and you get some idea of what people might be willing to pay for it. You could be wrong. But now what do you do? You and all the other entrepreneurs who are producing a variety of products, the multiplicity of products that make up the, the entire com, com, um, uh, economy. They all are all looking forward at their particular goods that they want to produce. And then they all, if I get this right here, yes, they all go to the resource markets and they bid for resources, land, labor, capital goods, and so on. So what the social appraisement process does is on an individual level, the entrepreneurs appraise future prices, okay? These prices emerge out of people's out of qualitative knowledge of people's value scales. The entrepreneurs have to know how they value these things. They have to forecast them. So this process transforms qualitative knowledge that's in people's heads, and that's expressed through behavior on the market, into quantitative ratios. That is price ratios. The price is necessary for resources. Okay. So this is what permits uh, the, the market economy to calculate. It in, encompasses everyone, okay? And it is a transcendent process. It transcends any human being. It's a true social phenomenon. Just as the, the, the division of labor, where people are specialized, is a true social phenomenon, the um, intellectual division of labor actually is superimposed upon that. It, it actually directs and allows to exist the... Um, the division of labor, and cooperation. Okay. Um, and I think I have a minute or two more. Uh, okay, this just sums up what I said. Okay, basic lesson that you can always, no matter what you want to produce, you can always figure out the cost of production. And you can always forecast what you think the price will be, so you can always to decide whether or not you'll be, using re you'll be wasting resources or using them uh, in a way that benefits consumers and benefits you in the form of profits. So there was a number of responses to Mises' original article by some German economists. There were some naive responses. One was by the fanatical socialist Marxist, uh, Marxist um, Otto Neurath, and he said, what's the problem? We'll just add up things in kind. We'll add up Kilowatts of energy will, will add up, tons of coal, gallons of paint, and we can do accounting without money. Of course, that's crazy. Every schoolboy knows that that's crazy. And, and Neurath actually uh, was a, a student in Vienna with Mises in the great uh, Eugen von Bombawerk's seminar, who was the, the, the student of Menger. Okay. He was an idiot. <laughs> I mean, I can't say, what else can I say? <laughs> Calculating with labor hours. Okay, well, everyone works and, and, and everyone has labor hours, so we can figure out what, you know, how many labor hours it takes to produce a good. They got this from, from Ricardo, the classical economist, and we can then determine the cost that way. Well, is the labor hour of the just retired, um, let's say, Kobe Bryant, equal in value to the labor hour of the 12th man who sits on the bench in, 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 in the N NBA? Of course, even in the same profession, the labor hours aren't of the same quality. But when you start comparing labor hours of a brain surgeon to labor hours of a software engineer to labor hours of, 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 of someone on a construction crew, you can see that they're heterogeneous. It's just like, again, adding apples and oranges. Also, that solution leaves out um, capital goods and land. Labor is more, the same labor will be more productive if instead of shovels and picks, 
he's equipped with, 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 with uh, a backhoe that's, that's digging the, um, the foundation for a home, let's say. So Mises already ad addressed this before the, the criticisms came. Um, assuming a stationary economy, this was a little bit more sophisticated, but not much. Uh, basically, they said, well, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to tell on the last day of capitalism, or rather on the first day of socialism, we're going to keep everybody in place, tell the managers, do exactly what you did yesterday, and tell all the workers to do the same thing. <laughs> okay? To just keep doing that. But of course, that would work in an economy of dead people, or, or people of, of robots that just did the same thing and had the same tastes and so on. Okay? It does not, does not work in the real world. There's technological breakthroughs, people's values are continually changing. The whole purpose of an economy is to shift resources from lower to higher valued uses. So a stationary economy, so assuming a stationary economy assumes the problem away, it doesn't solve the problem. Okay? And uh, I had, I'll just show you a few others, the more sophisticated ones, market socialism, mathematical solutions, and so on. Mises basically said that um, market socialism, uh, where, where the government uh, sets prices, is playing market, okay, playing with prices. It's like children um, playing with prices. He said you could get the right prices, or the prices are the same as picking prices out of a hat. Okay. And a mathematical solution. Mathematical solution is very sophisticated, but it applies, as Mises pointed out, only to a stationary economy where there are no profits. Okay. So it can tell you exactly what to produce if people's tastes, if the technology, and if the resources were frozen forever into the future. Right. Um, there's more to be said about that, but uh, I'm out of time, so I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you.